Media YouTube. Okay, we're over here at the Constitution Society, and we're just going to go through these pictures here real quick. Who are these people? They were the alleged founders of the Constitution, the original wordsmiths. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind about these well-educated people is that they were in themselves an oligarchy. They were indeed wordsmiths. But what did these wordsmiths actually write in this Constitution? I often wonder why so many people that claim to study the Constitution, support it, believe in it, all that, and why they still are so patriotic to it, given its nature in the first place. Now, nobody ever stops to think, how did they get the ability to sell us back these rights in the first place? And the answer is, they first had to take them from you. Now, just stop and consider that one small aspect for a moment. How are they able to grant you anything that they first didn't take from you in the first place? Now, we're going to look at Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph, or Clause 3, Commerce Clause. Okay, and for that, just the intro, Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Okay, to borrow money on the credit of the United States. Alright, who did that end up being? You. To regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, Right there is a whole big barrel of monkeys, a whole can of worms, because the Commerce Clause allows Congress the right granted to themselves to engage in private acts and acts of commerce. Okay? Private acts and acts of commerce. Okay, and so now we'll read the definition of private in Black's first affecting or belonging to private individuals as distinct from public generally, not official. Okay, and then anybody who's been studying law for any time knows that an individual is a commercial unit okay it is not referring to the living being and just for fun we'll read private act a statute remember a statute is a statement of compulsion operating only upon upon particular persons and private concerns and of which the courts are not bound to take notice and again the word person is also a commercial unit unit and does not refer to the living being and just for fun We'll read private law as used in contradistinction to public law the term means all that part of the law which is administered between citizen and citizen or which is concerned with the definition regulation and enforcement of rights in cases where both the person in whom the right inheres and the person on whom the obligation is incident are private individuals. See public law. Okay, now let's look at the word commerce. The various agreements 
what you have for their object facilitating the exchange of the products of the earth or the industry of man with an intent to realize a profit a general term including the specific contracts of sale and exchange the intercourse of nations and each other's produce and manufactures in which the superfluities of one are given for those of another and then re exchange with, with other nations for mutual wants. Commerce is the interchange or mutual change of goods, productions, or property of any kind between nations or individuals. Transportations. Transportation is the means by which commerce is carried on. Commerce is a term of the largest import. It comprehends intercourse for the purposes of trade in any and all its forms, including the transportation, purchase, sale, and exchange of commodities between the citizens of our country and the citizens or subjects of other countries, and between the citizens of different states. The power to regulate it embraces all the instruments by which such commerce may be conducted. Commerce is not limited to an exchange of commodities, but includes as well intercourse with foreign nations and between the states and includes the transportation of passengers. The words commerce and trade are synonymous but not identical. They are often used interchangeably but strictly speaking commerce relates to intercourse or dealings with foreign nations, states, or political communities while trade denotes businesses, intercourse, or mutual traffic within the limits of a state or a nation or the buying, selling, and exchanging of articles between members of the same community. Now we'll go back to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph, or Clause 4. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. And we'll go back to the word expect, go back to blacks first. Ex post facto, after the fact, by an act or fact occurring after some previous act or fact and relating thereto by subsequent matter. The opposite of ab initio, thus a deed may be good ab initio, or if invalid at its inception may be confirmed by matter ex post facto. So we go back here to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9. Clause 3. We just previously read. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. So that means that's the end of the Constitution. Everything else is commentary based on private acts and acts of commerce. What's the first one? No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. Okay. Capitation. From Latin, caput, head. A poll tax. An imposition periodically laid, periodically laid upon each person. A tax or imposition raised on each person in consideration of his labor, industry, office, rank, etc. It is a very ancient kind of tribute and answers to what the Latins called tributum, by which taxes on persons are distinguished from taxes on merchandise called victigalia. Over here at Avalon dot yale dot edu the articles of confederation written in 1777 agreed upon march 1st 1781 let's go down to article 12 all bills of credit emitted monies borrowed and debts contracted by or under the authority of congress before the assembling of the united states in pursuance of the present confederation shall be deemed and considered as a charge against the United States for payment and satisfaction whereof the said United States and the public faith are hereby solemnly pledged 
they pledged the public faith, which was you, which is you. They have put you on the hook for the debt, for congressional debt, that they wrote about a year after the Constitution was written. Okay, these are the same people that wrote this. Now, just while we're here, is to define what the United States of America is. It's a style of this confederacy. Now, what is a confederacy? Confederacy. In criminal law, the association or banding together of two or more persons for the purpose of committing an act or furthering an enterprise which is forbidden by law, or which, though lawful in itself, becomes unlawful when made the object of the confederacy. Conspiracy is a more technical term for this offense. Also, the act of two or more who combine together to do any damage or injury to another or to do any unlawful act. Okay, and there's more, but you get the idea. And of course, we go back to Constitution Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. Isn't this one lovely? To declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. The letter of mark and reprisal is what turns a pirate into a privateer. That nice shiny badge that the cops wear is indicative of a letter of mark and reprisal granted by the federal government held back in a vault back at the police station that allows them to rape, pillage, plunder, kill, maim, steal, as long as they give a portion back to the federal state. And that is what the uh, letters of mark and reprisal has done to open up the way to the police state. Uh, the General Welfare Clause was also usurped by the Article 12 of the Articles of Confederation. And I should point that out because we've been under corporate welfare ever since. So, when we go back to these original framers of the Constitution, you really have to think twice about who they really were.